Now turn with me in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 45. So we'll be reading the first eight verses, and it's worth uh, noticing that in verse 1, there's a mention of Cyrus, and you might remember that Cyrus was the king or the ruler over the nation of Persia. Uh, he's mentioned at the end of Second Chronicles and Second Kings, also at the start of um, Ezra, and he's the one who announces that Israel can go out of what was Babylon and back to the land of Canaan. Uh, or Israel. And so this is written about at least 150 years before Cyrus. So starting reading at verse 1. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes and secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name, I name you, Though you do not know me, I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Shower, O heavens, from above, and let the clouds rain down righteousness. Let the earth open that salvation and righteousness may bear fruit. Let the earth cause them both to sprout. I, the Lord, have created it. And we're now going to read from, together from the Belgic Confession, uh, Article 13. should be up there on the screen behind me. And really in reading the Belgic Confession, we understand this as being uh, simply an explanation of the truths we believe as Christians and as a church. So we don't see it as the same as the Bible. The Bible is our sole authority, but rather we see it as a good explanation of the truths of the Bible. So Article 13 the providence of God. We believe that this good God, after he had created all things, did not abandon them or give them up to fortune or chance, but that according to his holy will, he so rules and governs them that in this world nothing happens without his direction. Yet God is not the author of the sins which are committed, nor can he be charged with them. For his power and goodness are so great and beyond understanding that he ordains and executes his work in the most excellent and just manner, even when devils and wicked men act unjustly. And as to his actions surpassing human understanding, we will not curiously inquire further than our capacity allows us, but with the greatest humility and reverence, we adore the just judgments of God which are hidden from us, and we content ourselves that we are pupils of Christ, who have only to learn those things which he teaches us in his word without transgressing these limits. This doctrine of providence gives us inexpressible consolation, for we learn thereby that nothing can happen to us by chance, but only by the direction of our gracious Heavenly Father. He watches over us with fatherly care, keeping all creatures so under his power that not one hair of our head, for they are all numbered, nor one sparrow can fall to the ground without the will of our Father. 
In this we trust because we know that he restrains the devil and all our enemies so that they cannot hurt us without his permission and will. We therefore reject the damnable error of the Epicureans and many in our day and age today who say that God does not concern himself with anything but leaves all things to chance. Will you pray with me now? Lord God, we thank you that you are the God of majesty, the God of power, the God of authority, the God who reigns over all things. And so, Lord, we pray that you would overcome our unbelief, overcome the ways that this world has influenced our thinking and living, and help us to see you and to see the world as you say that it is. Lord, we pray indeed that as you have written in your word, that we would not be conformed to this world, but rather that we might be transformed through the renewing of our minds. Lord, we know that only your Spirit can truly renew our minds. So would you do it, Holy Spirit, for the glory of the Son. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this evening, we're going to think together about the truth or the doctrine of providence. And providence, quite simply... Is the idea that God rules over all things for the good of his people. It's God's comprehensive sovereignty applied personally to the Christian. That's an incredibly important and precious truth that we live in a personal world that is ruled over by a personal God who is our loving Father. However, it's also a truth which can very understandably uh, raise a host of questions. If God's in control, if God is good, then why is the world the way it is? Why cancer? Why wars? Why trafficking and human violence? Why mental illness? Why loneliness? Right, these are real questions that we have, aren't they? are real philosophical questions, but even more pressingly, are real human, personal questions. That if God governs and rules over all things in love, then why am I still single? Why is my family a mess? Why is my health so poor? How come my children took that path? How come so many have to die in Gaza and in Ukraine? Right, these are real questions, aren't they? Legitimate questions that we feel. So we'll just park that, and we'll come back to some of that a little bit later. And really we want to think together on the basis of this passage we've read in Isaiah about the truth of providence. And really in reading those verses from Isaiah, are two things kind of leap out at us. And the first one of those two things is that God's control is absolute. It is absolute. So you might remember that Isaiah was a prophet in in Judah in the times of King Uzziah through King Hezekiah. Israel has just gone into exile under Assyria, and Judah is under the shadow of this foreign nation. And Isaiah 40 through 66 are really forward-looking chapters for Israel in their own exile under Babylon to come. So basically, the chapter that we've read here was written long before the exile, but it was written for Israel in the exile. And so the first remarkable thing to notice about this chapter is that Cyrus is explicitly named even though he won't be on the scene for another 150-odd years. Right, it's remarkable. If archaeology is your thing, then you can look up what's called the Cyrus Cylinder, right, a historical artifact that Cyrus wrote at this time. But the point here in Isaiah isn't hard to grasp. 
the point of naming Cyrus is that the Lord is the God of history. Uh, He's the God who sees the beginning from the end. He's the God who will raise up Cyrus to fulfill his own purposes. In this case, the purpose of restoring Judah and exile back to the land, as you can see in verse 13. You see, Cyrus may be the ruler of a vast empire, but he's just an instrument in the hand of God. Cyrus may be a great king, but God is the great king who reigns over everything. And you can particularly see that point crystallized in verse 7 if you glance down there. Now the Lord explicitly says, I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. And the point isn't unclear. God's plainly stating, I'm over everything. I'm over history, I'm over nations, I'm over creation, I'm over every detail in your life. I'm sovereign over the things that may seem good, I'm sovereign over the things that may not seem good. That's the same point that Paul makes in Ephesians 1, where he talks about being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the purpose of his will. With a well-known verse Romans 8, 28, that for those who love God, all things work together for good. And actually think for a moment about what it would be like if God wasn't over all things, the bad as well as the good. It would be a terrifying world, a world where any suffering, any disease, any moral evil is outside of God's control and jurisdiction. It would be a world in which it's no use praying about the struggles in your life because God has no control there. And actually, one of the reasons why God's absolute control is so incredibly important is because it's at odds with the way most of the people around us view reality. Most people in our world view reality in one of two different ways. Now, the first way many people view reality is what we might call an atheistic worldview. And it's the understanding that this world in which we live is a closed system, which is fully explainable by science. Reality is restricted to that which is seeable and that which is provable. Now, all things happen in this worldview according to the laws of nature. So your suffering that you may be going through in your life is intrinsically comparable to, say, a bird breaking its wing. But sad, but it's not meaningful. Right, it's just tough luck. You got cancer, pity, but biologically explainable. Right, survival of the fittest. That's the first way people understand the world. The second is what we might call an agnostic worldview. And really that's, in that understanding, there may be a God, there may be someone or something looking down from above, but whoever or whatever it is, is distant, unknowable, right? Not actively involved in this world in any meaningful way. Now he or it is a little bit like say, the captain of a cruise liner. He might be directing the course of the ship in a big picture way, but he's not involved individually or personally with the passengers in any meaningful way. He's just a distant, far-off image, or distant, far-off person. And actually, while these two ways of understanding reality are very distinct, they're actually also very similar. Because in both perspective, any moments in our lives are not rooted in any higher reality, right? They just are. So if things are going well in these worldviews, great, you got lucky. If things aren't going well and are horrible, tough luck, just the way it is, right? It's a world in which this really is it. 
But of course, the biblical view of reality couldn't be further from this. Because God's control is not only absolute, but God's control is personal. And isn't that a wonderful reality? You see, the second thing that we can see in these verses in Isaiah 45 is actually the heart of God or what drives his control. That his reign is not kind of arbitrary. No, he has clear objectives. And we can see at least two of these objectives in these verses before us. God's working for the glory of his name and God's working for the good of his people. You can see in in these verses that God's working for the glory of his own name. And verse 3, he talks about that Cyrus may know that I, the Lord, the that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by name. You see that in verse 6, that he's working, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, there is no other. Right? God's working to reveal his own glory and worth so that all people would know him, worship him, and be satisfied in him. But he's also working for the good of his chosen people. You can see that if you glance down at verse 4, where he says, Actually, for the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen. You can see it down in verse 13. That God's reign is not one of a cruel dictator. No, God's reign is that of a loving father who cares deeply about his children. And can you see just how different that view of reality is from that of the atheist or the agnostic. It means that this world is intrinsically personal because it was made by a personal, knowable God. That he is actively involved in the guidance of every atom, every breath of wind, every red blood cell. He orders reality from the biggest political movements to the growth of the smallest blade of grass. And he does it for the good of his people. And so that means actually we don't live in a cold scientific world in which everything is a closed system. We don't live in a world where the spiritual is disconnected and distant from the everyday living. No, we live in a personal world, ruled over by a personal God who is our loving Father. You see, these are totally different types of worlds. One of them bursts with meaning. The other is devoid of meaning. Now, one of them is intimately personal, while the other is coldly impersonal. You see, surely this is the sort of thing that, even if it wasn't true, you should want it to be true. Right? Wouldn't you want to live in a world like that? A world where you knew that all things were under the control of your loving Father and would work ultimately for your good. However, it does raise the questions that we mentioned earlier. That if God is in control even of evil, doesn't that make him evil? How can a good God use that which is not good? That which is cruel, inhumane. And of course, to answer comprehensively would take an entire sermon series, but we can briefly say two things. We can briefly say that at least part of the answer is that God overrules wicked intent for good purposes. That such is his power and wisdom that he can bring good out of that which is evil. So you might think of Joseph. Right? Joseph's brothers sin grievously in selling him to slavery, lying to his parents. And yet God works through their evil to accomplish his good purposes, the saving of his people and good to the people of Egypt. Or even more significantly, you might think of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Right? The single greatest moral evil that's ever happened in this world. Judas intends to make some money. The high priests intend to get rid of a threat. The Romans intend to keep the peace. 
And God intends to bring salvation to all of his people. Right? Same action, different intents. The second thing that we can always say is, of course, that this is a deep mystery. And that it requires profound humility as creatures. Right, a child won't always know nor understand the decisions of his parents. And a creature will not always know nor understand the decisions of his creator. And it's here that actually the Belgic Confession does give us great wisdom. And one of the things that it says is it says this. It says we will not curiously inquire further than our capacity allows us, but with the greatest humility and reverence, We adore the just judgments of God, which are hidden from us, and we content ourselves that we are pupils of Christ, who have only to learn those things which he teaches us in his word, without transgressing these limits. And kind of what it's saying or communicating is the wonderful truth that actually we don't need to have all the answers to be able to trust in our God. I don't need to know all the ins and outs of tax law to be able to trust my accountant to do my taxes. I just have to know that he knows what he's doing and that he's acting on my behalf or for my good. And actually it's the same with God, right? We're passengers. We're not the drivers. And so we don't have to understand every mystery of providence to be able to trust God in the midst of our lives, We can simply trust that God's at the wheel. He knows what he's doing, and he's working for our good. Now, maybe one way to think about it is that we won't always know the why, but we will always know the who. And of course, the who is the God who is our Father in Christ, the God who sent his own Son and loved to die for us. The God who's gladly welcomed us into his family, filled us with his spirit, and only ever shown us love and kindness. And so this wonderful biblical truth of providence means that actually whatever comes your way in life comes from the hand of your loving Father. It means that there's not one square inch of your life, your circumstances, or this world, which are not firmly under the control of your God. Your life is not like a leaf tossed to and fro by the winds of chance. No, your life is governed by your Father. And so actually any suffering in your life that you may be going through, it's not just bad luck, deal with it. No, it has meaning because it's placed there by your Father. And the medicine may be exceedingly bitter, but we trust the hand that has given it to us. Remember the words of Job? The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And it's not only to do with the bad things, but also the good things. It means that actually every good and precious gift in your life is not because you're so smart, or you're so capable, No, it's a personalized gift from your God. And so while providence can seem controversial, it's incredibly precious. Get rid of providence and you get rid of every meaningful aspect of Christian comfort in this life. And so the call to us as God's people is really to believe what you know and to put it into practice. And of course, that's hard work, isn't it? It's hard work because of the sin that remains in our own hearts. But it's also hard work because we live in a world which is constantly training us to live as if there was no God. Right? We know that, don't you? Don't we? That whenever you open the newspaper, whenever you watch a TV show, whenever you read a novel, God's just absent. Right? He's not there. He's not even taken into consideration. Right? Sometimes even fellow Christians communicate to us a, an intrinsically godless view of this world. And so we're often being trained by this world to live and feel and think as if there's no God. And so the challenge here is to remind ourselves of these things. Remind ourselves 
our Lord, uh, of the good things in our lives. That whenever something good is in our lives that brings us joy and happiness, think gift, a gift from my Father. And whenever life is hard and dark and sorrowful, reminding ourselves, even this, is from the hand of my Father who loves me and who knows what he's doing. We live in a personal world governed by a personal God who is our loving Father. All things come to us from the hand of our God. We may not always know the why, but we do always know the who. And I'm going to close by just reading a beautiful hymn which really communicates what it means to live as a Christian under providence. Now, it's a wonderful old hymn, God Moves in a Mysterious Way. So I've got the words up here. You can either read along, you can just close your eyes and let it over, uh, soak over you as we think about this. This is what it says. God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep and unfathomable minds of never-failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. You fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and shall break with blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. You fearful saints, fresh courage take. You've got a God who's in control and a God ruling and reigning for your good. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we do thank you that it is a wonderful thing that you reign, Lord. It is a wonderful thing that you work all things according to the counsel of your will, and it's a wonderful thing that you do so, our Lord, with us in mind. That you do so with a love for your own glory and a love for your chosen people. And Father, we thank you not only that you do this, but that you reveal it to us. That we can know that we are living day by day and moment by moment in your world over which you are king and over which all things which come to us come through your hand. Lord, we thank you. We do not understand it. We can't comprehend it, Lord. We don't understand uh, why you allow many of the things that you do. But Lord, we trust that you know what you are doing, that your ways are beyond finding out, and your ways are good, even if we do not understand them. And so, Lord, thanks and praise be to your name, and we pray that you would help us to live as children of such a God. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.